Welcome to the listeners. It's time for episode 123 of the Slump Buster podcast. On today's episode, Kyle explains why he hates the Washington Wizards. We explain the college football playoffs in all the possible scenarios. And of course, we go through our week 13 NFL predictions. But before we get into that, folks, let's give a shout out to our partners. Caveman Coffee Co. Caveman is a fantastic single source, single origin goodness from a company with impeccable taste and ethics. The people behind it are beautiful souls, and the coffee is delicious fuel for the never-ending quest to do better, be better, love harder, and enjoy deeper. Guys, I tell you, their Nitro Cold Brew is the perfect blend of energy and refreshment in the morning. Great way to start the day. But why stop there? They have their Mammoth Blends, which I highly encourage you getting. They have their Hibiscus Teas, which are delicious. And guys, if you use our promo code SLUMP, you get 15% off your next purchase of any of these fantastic products cavemancoffeeco.com promo code slump guys don't be a chump use promo code slump and get yourself a case today all right listeners this is up for the episode kyle ledbetter juju talk sports episode one two three let's get it let's bust the slump and let's enjoy All right, Kyle. So we were breaking it down before the show here, but busy week in sports. We have a ton of headlines in the MLB. We've been dropping some free agency videos throughout the week. So if you're watching this on YouTube, check out the rest of the channel for that. Did you drop your NBA power rankings? People are going to question you on the Lakers still being in the top 10, even though LeBron going on COVID, neither here nor there. I didn't have that information at the time. I I didn't have the LeBron going in the COVID protocol on Sunday. (laughs) But you know, in fairness, didn't you feel a little sick watching them have to come back from 15 points down against the Pistons they were already playing like a team that was diagnosed with something diagnosed with the case of the mediocres there is something wrong there especially because now we have uh, an alternative at the start of the year the thing I kept saying is like I don't love the Lakers but also no one else in the Western Conference is really that good and now we know the Warriors are those dudes and the Phoenix Suns are those dudes this year so oh yeah we we now have alternatives speaking of the Suns there I mean I imagine obviously we're still now a couple weeks out from your next power rankings update but they literally have now head-to-head wins against the Warriors and Nets in the last week. They are on fire, including, what is it now, a 15, 16, 17 game win streak or something along those lines? Yeah, they have been one of the craziest surprises this year because I felt like last year when they got to the finals was a byproduct of everyone getting hurt. And so the fact that they've done it this year with the same core of people coming back and they look like they can, not necessarily that they will make the finals, but that they're a team that's like close to a pencil in for the Western Conference finals. And the only way they wouldn't is probably just like bad matchups in the second round like a team that expects to make it to the conference finals is a step up from where I thought Phoenix is going to be this year so they've been genuinely surprising considering that they didn't really add anyone this offseason other than just like Landry Shamet but they didn't really do anything else to add to the team and they're still that good is is shocking now they're not as good as the record suggests anytime you have a 17 game win streak you're going to come back down to earth at some point but they're still really really good and that's kind of the big takeaway that you can have from Phoenix this year, which is not what I thought at the start of the year at all. Yeah, I think we're starting to get to that point, too, where we more or less know the true frauds. There's not too many teams that I think are still skating by. I mean, speaking of which, I mean, your Wizards hate is showing through here. Are you just determined to piss off Wizards fans all year? I don't understand what the hate is behind it. Like, this is this is a victory for the Wizards. The fact that they're 12 this year, that's a big deal because the Wizards were supposed to be, like, not good at all this year. Like, if Brad Bradley Beal is your best player and Contavious Caldwell Pope is your second best player. Like that team should be like fighting for a playoff berth. And the fact that I'm basically making them like the sixth best team in the Eastern conference, that's, that's a pretty big concession. Like that's a great job on their part this year. Uh, The only thing the wizards can do to actually be like a legitimately good team is just do it for longer. And unfortunately they can't win 40 games in, in a month. So it just, if you do it for longer than a 20 game, sample Wizards fans you will shock me even more than I've been shocked by the Phoenix Suns so keep up the good work I think being the sixth best team in the east is a major victory for the Wizards I guess that's the key phrase the longer the sample size is so I guess after 40 games we'll revisit that conversation and see where they're at though I do think that considering you mentioned Catavius Caldwell Pope I'm sure the Lakers would want some of those pieces that they traded away for Russ at this point because at least their team construct the Wizards have seems to be a little more fluent team 
team than the Lakers have. It seems like a broken team schematically. The Lakers have had to deal with a, in a correlation too with obviously LeBron's injuries. I mentioned his COVID situation now where he's expected to miss multiple games, not to mention he's been out with a numerous amount of injuries that you're just like, man, I feel like I've barely seen LeBron play like two games this year at this point. Yeah, no, it's it's been a weird year for the Lakers. I'm not going to say they can't win anymore, but I, obviously the confidence is wavering at this point. And they're obviously mortal at this point. Uh, they don't play good defense. And the year they won the championship, they were the best defensive team in the NBA. So I think that's the simplest explanation for why the Lakers are like hanging around 500 this year, hanging around the fifth or sixth seed. I think if they get all three of them healthy for the playoffs, which I think is the ultimate goal because the regular season doesn't matter at all to the Lakers this year if they get everyone healthy they at very least have a fighting shot in this one but man have you seen how good the Warriors have been <laughs> that's the thing that... though you said it doesn't matter but man if they finish as the seventh seed or the eighth seed and have to go Warriors or Suns first round that kind of sucks yeah but playing them in the first round instead of the second round kind of doesn't really make that much of a difference for them I think it's you're gonna have to play thing. them at some point yeah but you know how the playoffs work you like to face the best teams at the end there you don't want to just square up with them you kind of want to get eased into the playoffs face a Orlando Magic or face a also also ran of the NBA you don't want to just go straight up oh yeah we get to face the 2017 Warriors yay yeah it's fair but there's no way to to fix that one other than like adding value to regular season games we talked about it obviously all last month with the the Dodgers and Giants being the two best teams in baseball and having to play in the divisional series or last year in the playoffs where Milwaukee and Brooklyn was the de facto NBA finals of one of the great playoff series of all time. It just happened to be in the second round just because of the way that seeding broke. If it were up to me, I would just start seeding teams now instead of playing the regular season games. Just say we can write the Lakers in as the third seed and they don't have to play the rest of the season. And then they'll play the Suns in the second round. Um, but obviously you have to play the games and the Lakers, as long as the Lakers get in, I think they're cool. I, I don't think they care which seed they end up in or whether they have to play the Clippers in the first round round or the Clippers in the second round. I think they're fine with that either way. Looking like a play-in tournament, so that still is a little scary there. That's not a place you want to be in, but let's get into the biggest story that we wanted to talk about on this podcast in particular, college football. So we have our second to last CFP poll come out this last week. At Number one, of course, undefeated, best defense in college football history, the Georgia Bulldogs. At number two, the Michigan Wolverines. Number three, Alabama <laughs> Alabama, you just can't count out Nick Saban. And then number four, the Cincinnati Bearcats. And right behind them, of course, at five and six, Oklahoma State and Notre Dame, who has a loss to Cincinnati earlier in the year and also is having to deal with the wake of while well, their head coach is currently out there taking pictures at LSU at this current point in time. So Notre Dame, they're pretty much counting out their chances, I would assume, at this point. Michigan, let's start there. Michigan got the big victory this past weekend and one of the longest running rivalries in college football against their rival Ohio State. Jim Harbaugh, of course, breaking his winless streak against them. And I believe Ohio State had ran it up to, what, eight straight games against Michigan at that point. If you want to go all the way back, I believe it was 15 of 16 with one victory in between for Michigan. Yeah, so the point is, ownage was definitely ownage between Ohio State and Michigan, albeit I think Michigan still technically has the all-time winning record against Ohio State. But recent history between Jim Tressel, Urban Meyer, Ryan Day, it's been a lot of ass kickings between Ohio State and Michigan. But you look at what Michigan was able to do in that game. They bullied the Ohio State rushing at defense. I mean, Hassan Haskins had his five touchdown day. How Michigan's been winning these games is just a solid one-two punch at their running back position. And they feel like a Harbaugh team. They feel like what I think about what a traditional Jim Harbaugh team is. They want to go out there, punch you in the mouth. This is all a 2012, 2013 San Francisco 49 when he had the combination of Bowman, Willis, and of course, Frank Gore in the backfield. That's exactly what he's mimicking over there with Michigan. Now, here's where it kind of gets a little scary, you know, for someone that defends Jim. They still do have to win a game this week. They still have to go against the Iowa Hawkeyes, who do have a very anemic offense at this point in the season with Spencer Petras at quarterback. But coming off a huge emotional win like that against Ohio State, I'm not going to say that I'm not scared. But Kyle, I guess I got to throw this to you here because because what was it about three weeks ago that you're saying Michigan is not competing for a national championship or competing for a CFP? Yeah, yeah, 
forgot. I did say that when we were trying to figure it out. You know who else I forgot to mention in there? Oklahoma State. And now all of a sudden they're going to make it too. So I was just absolutely godforsakenly wrong about all of that. Michigan, uh, I think it was the the shutdown full cast that had my favorite quote of the week, which is this is the greatest moment in the history of Michigan football, not only because you got to beat Ohio State to make it to the playoff and kick them out of the playoff, but you did it in exactly the way you dreamed of defeating Ohio State, which is four yard run, four yard run, five yard run, five yard run, seven yard run. Just break their will. Yep. Just 48 carries for 300 yards. It's the greatest dream of all Michigan fans of all time is that you got to beat them exactly the way that you always dreamed of, which is Big Ten football. I'm amazed they scored 42 points in that game, by the way. That, I was watching that game, uh, working through an airport, and it was like 14-13 at halftime. And then I saw it was 42 at the end, and I couldn't believe Michigan had found a way to score that many points against Ohio State. Speaking of Ohio State, by the way, I was really surprised that the committee fell them all the way to seven, which kind of was not what I was thinking, considering it was setting up for like Alabama is still going to make the playoff with two losses this year. And they were, they were pretty cut and dry about it. Like all the one loss yeah. teams are going to be ahead of all the two loss teams. And so Ohio state fell all the way down to seven with that second loss of the season, which I but guess, I guess college rough now with the Utah one. It does, but I still thought that they would stay ahead of at least Notre Dame. I thought Notre Dame was going to be in the seven spot and and maybe they would have been ahead of Oklahoma State, maybe not. But I was just surprised that they were at two, lost to five, and fell all the way to seven. I found that a, a little bit surprising. But so be it. Ohio State's out of the running at this point, barring like a just utter chaos weekend just coming up this week. The other thing I found fascinating about Michigan, this is the first time ever that Michigan is playing in a Big Ten championship game. Because the Big Ten championship game, I believe, started back in like 2004. And apparently across close to 20 years, Michigan has just never won their division or won whenever they moved to the division alignment in the Big Ten, which is something I kind of forgot. Michigan's kind of been mediocre at football for like two decades now, and it's kind of weird to think about that because they're always like pretty good. Jim Harbaugh has had a really good run at Michigan, even as he gets crapped on all the time for never beating Ohio State or being 50-50 against Michigan State. I think that's just expectations being set too high because Jim Harbaugh was inheriting a team that is not Ohio State, and I don't know if they have the resources to ever be Ohio State, but now they find themselves as this consistently tier two and tier three program, which if the last you know week has taught us anything, these are the programs that usually get that get their coaches poached by bigger programs. But Jim Harbaugh seems to be relatively committed to Michigan, even though he was like flirting with the Detroit Lions job last year a little bit. Well, for Jim, this is a passion project type thing. This is going back to his home school, going back with a chance to win. In a national championship. I know we probably will look at that Georgia matchup and not give Michigan much of a chance, but if they do the exact game plan that they ran against Ohio State, I'm not going to completely count them out. If you could run the ball and oh, dominate I will, time because, of possession because Georgia like that, has gigantic human beings on that defensive line. But and Georgia also them. doesn't necessarily have a difference making quarterback under center as well. So that's where Michigan has an <laughs> opportunity to potentially compete in that game if it came down to it. My only counter there would be, of course, I don't have much faith in Cade McNamara. He's a fine game manager, but we even saw in that game against Ohio State, you had J.J. McCarthy come off the bench and hit some big time throws. Now, to Jim's credit, he's been able to mix and match those guys to get the most out of them, but obviously you're not going to be able to get another five touchdown performance like you got out of Haskins. That's where, of course, Blake Corum comes into it and their ability to roll with those guys. I don't think it's improbable to see Georgia lose. We've also seen Kirby Smart, his uh, big game expectations too, have come short of expectations recently. And hell, I don't think that anyone completely counts Alabama out against Georgia this weekend either, because in Nick Saban's career against Kirby Smart, talk about ownage being ownage. I think Alabama could very easily walk away with this with a two touchdown win. And I know this is the best Georgia team we've seen, but if you told me that just Bryce Young balled out and went out there and killed the Bulldogs, I would not be surprised on Sunday morning. I will say in defense of Georgia this year, Georgia allowed 83 total points in the regular season this year. Uh, I believe the next closest for like a national champion in the history of college football was the 2001 Miami Hurricanes who had 106 in the regular season. I think Tennessee 
had two touchdowns in the first quarter against Georgia and then didn't score the rest of the game. But that was like the only time we saw Georgia's defense go down. All of that to say, I still would pick Alabama in this game because I'm just petrified of Alabama being Alabama, even though they did everything they could to just poop the bed this weekend against Auburn and, you know, win in the weird four overtime rule format thing. And who knows? I I, have, I mean, I'm more fascinated by this is, is the committee setting it up to screw over Cincinnati? I'm looking at how this is all working out and if Alabama keeps it close against Georgia Oklahoma State gets another top 10 win against Baylor they might be setting this up to screw over Cincinnati and if that happened I think we we would start to see some chaos unfold throughout the college football landscape more chaos than there's already been in the last three days but this is everything changing right in front of our eyes if Cincinnati gets left out of the playoff on this one but they're setting it up to maybe do it they're setting it up to screw them over a little See, if you gave a two-loss Alabama team a spot in the playoffs, I think people would almost be ready to riot. And if, of course, if you leave out Cincinnati in that situation. But I think that that won't be the case for Alabama. I think if they do get the two losses, they will be left out. That's just my gut reaction feeling today that if Georgia puts them away on Saturday, then they will officially eliminate Alabama, which the you talked about just in general, the intriguing possibilities here. Oklahoma State, I mean, let's say Alabama gets the victory against Georgia. Oklahoma State versus Cincinnati is such a compelling argument to make because as much as I love the story of Cincinnati, they went undefeated hypothetically in this scenario. Oklahoma State's over there. They're winning the Big 12. They beat Oklahoma. They beat Baylor. They beat Texas. They beat all the schools they needed to beat in a tougher conference (laughs) with a tougher schedule. And I like the possibility. So obviously college football is less star driven in terms of players, but more star driven in terms of coaches. If you're telling me I get Mike Gundy, Jim Harbaugh, Kirby Smart, and Nick Saban, that's like a coaching matchup dream almost in a way, just from a personality. Like I'm thinking about these pregame press conferences. I'm thinking about Jim Harbaugh talking about why he doesn't eat chicken because it's a nervous animal. And I am enjoying that intrigue from a producing standpoint of the college game days and everything to get us ready for that. But Cincinnati being left out would just be so heartbreaking because this is now two straight years of them doing this. This is two straight years of them going out there and beating the teams in front of them. And last year too, I know Georgia was missing some guys because they opted out of the bowl game, but they actually competed against a Georgia team in a bowl game last year. I feel as though you talked to probably the players on that team. They're thinking in their mind, I want that revenge scenario. I want to go after Georgia. I know that we expect them to get killed in that matchup, but I think it would just be a fun thing for them. And I just want to see what it looks like to have a non-Power 5 school go. Like we haven't even seen that possibility broached since the CFP has existed. Boise State's prime was pre-CFP. Utah's prime was pre-CFP. TCU. And then we just kind of went into this wall where we didn't really have a team as good. We had UCF, but which, you That's know, I was going to point to. Yeah, we I, did I have UCF. I can get but, my shirt yeah. out of my closet right now. My 2017 UCF National Champion t-shirt. I can go get that and start wearing it on the podcast if we want to support our buddies over at UCF because that team, they didn't even give them a chance. They like, were like they didn't nine, even have right? A chance was to like the highest I think they gave them I think they got above that after they beat Auburn in the bowl game the first year and then the second year uh, Mackenzie Milton tore his knee and they lost to um, LSU without their starting quarterback by not that much I think it was only like 14 and then LSU the next year went on to win the championship and that is why I have that t-shirt in my closet of UCF national champions of 2017 because no one even gave it a shot and so the fact that we're here with Cincinnati is really really fascinating just to see that the change in college football as again this is the only team that's going to have a chance to do this because we're going to expand the college football playoff it's been a chaos year too that's also led into Cincinnati really having this opportunity the fact that we haven't had the traditional powers just dominating the rankings this year. Clemson falling off to being a nine and three team was a huge development because all the preseason polls, of course, had just Clemson and DJ Uolongole instantly being in the CFP, but that just didn't come to fruition this year. We don't have an ACC team in there. The Pac-12 
fell out like they usually do. So now it's like Big 12 possibilities aside from Oklahoma. That's something we haven't seen. And the SEC is back at it again with just two powerhouses competing for this one. And then the Big 10, I mean, Ohio State getting knocked out. This is a fun year, just from the standpoint of just seeing these teams in it, the, seeing these five teams. Like I said, Mike Gundy, who's been a perennial mid-range coach, to see him in that range, what? Oklahoma State doesn't even get the type of players that Oklahoma does. It's apples and oranges in terms of the type of recruits they get. So Oklahoma State competing here is so wild. Right now, the playoff percentages, of course, are 84%, might as well be 100% for Georgia, 80% for Michigan. So they're really not giving Iowa much of a chance. Cincinnati's over here seeing with 68% chance to make it. Oklahoma 61 and Alabama at 56. But the funny part about this too is also Alabama has a higher chance of winning the national title at a 20% odds than both Cincinnati at nine and Oklahoma at nine. <laughs> Isn't that yeah, kind of a funny thing? Because like, we know, here? oh, because all of this is leading to Cincinnati being like a 10 point underdog against Georgia and losing by like 17, because that's probably where all of this ends, because Georgia is just that good. I guess Michigan's the other team, but Michigan, I, I want to see Michigan, Alabama in the first round of the set, the CFP playoff. I want to, yes. I want to see that matchup. Because I think uh, the last I time we got more, it, most of Saban's players had opted out, if I recall. That for sure. I guess it's just because Oklahoma State is interesting against. Michigan. It's a close matchup, but I feel like both of those teams would get destroyed in the national championship against Georgia because I know they're right there, but it feels like they're a tier below. And maybe I'm just assigning Alabama based on reputation that they can compete with these teams. But I feel like if you put Alabama against Oklahoma State because of the just the pure talent of recruiting base, I feel like Alabama would be favored. If you put Alabama against Cincinnati, I'm almost certain Alabama would be favored for better or for worse. But maybe I'm just doing the assignment of I see all the six, eight, 300 pound future NFL draft guys on Alabama. And I don't see those all over the roster at the very least for Oklahoma State and Cincinnati, even though Cincinnati does, I think have three players who are first round graded prospects in this year's NFL draft. So Cincinnati's kind of a weird exception there because no one knows what to do with them as they're basically being treated like a big 12 team because they're about to, to go into the big 12 in the next couple of years. I guess UCF is now too, but but UCF kind of had to walk the path so that Cincinnati could then go two years of undefeated football and make it to the college football playoff. You mentioned Alabama being able to coast off your reputation here too. I think that's also worked against them in a way just because people associate that reputation with not being involved in a four overtime game this past weekend against Auburn or not being within a score of Tennessee late in the fourth quarter. Those wins are starting to look like bad wins as well, just in the sense of, because and it's crazy too with college football the differences between the nfl where we have to talk about bad wins versus bad losses and here because alabama i mean they, they're winning against the teams from 11-1 you're winning taking this to like notre dame you were surprised that ohio state was behind them i mean notre dame only has the one loss and the only one loss is against cincinnati who's in the top four so that's yeah a easy kind of like reason why I would have Notre Dame ahead of Ohio State, even though Ohio State obviously has more of a reputation for actually competing when they've made it to a CFP. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's kind of like transition into that though. Let's talk about this. The, the whole Notre Dame with Brian Kelly leaving LSU. What did you think when you first saw that move? Uh, I was amazed by that one because LSU did the best, they, they did the best money could buy in that situation for them. So I thought that was fascinating. In terms of Notre Dame making the college football playoff, I love all of the uh, ideas that people have thrown around of the compromise being Notre Dame gets in, but Mike Gundy coaches Notre Dame. I like that compromise in there. Notre Dame is refusing to name an interim coach for the time being because they don't know if they have any more games left to play. So, I mean, again, the only way Notre Dame has a chance of getting in is either Cincinnati or Oklahoma State or maybe Michigan loses. But I think even if Michigan loses, Michigan might get in over Notre Dame. But if Cincinnati or Oklahoma State have to lose on Saturday to, for Notre Dame to have a chance. And I love this possibility that they could slide 
slide into the playoff and not have a coach. It would probably be Marcus Freeman, the defensive coordinator, who I know Notre Dame fans are saying they want to just be named the full-time head coach right now. Uh, They've also talked about, obviously, Fickle over there at Cincinnati and Matt Campbell at Iowa State and all of that. But that'll be a conversation for down the road. The Brian Kelly going to LSU thing was really, really fascinating because of what Lincoln Riley did a a couple days before. Those two in combination created two of the most like power dynamic shifting moves that we've seen in college football. Uh, And that for them to happen within 24 hours is really quite remarkable, especially in a year where two weeks ago we were talking on the podcast about all of these job openings at programs where we've seen success before, whether it was USC or LSU or Florida or soon to be the University of Miami. We've talked about Texas in that context too. Those have made up like 50% of your national champions over the last 20 years. So we've seen the success and yet we also see not enough coaches available for all of them to get a great head coach. And then the game entirely changed on us because I didn't realize Lincoln Riley leaving Oklahoma was any kind of a possibility that Brian Kelly never happened to Notre Dame never happened to Oklahoma to lose a coach like that especially for a like a lateral transition in some people's minds when they think about Oklahoma versus USC a lot of people see them on the same tier in terms of historical prowess and I I think uh, you kind of mentioned it in your video that maybe it's the low-hanging fruit to talk about was Lincoln Riley just concerned about the SEC move for Oklahoma. But I do think it's still relevant to this conversation because going to the Pac-12, Lincoln Riley may be instantly in a position where he could win that conference in his first year, which I don't think is a crazy possibility because is he better than Kyle Whittingham? Is he better than Mario Cristobal? Who who knows if Mario Cristobal is going to still be in Oregon? Those are debatable things. So they might have the best schematic play caller already in their conference. And you're already starting to see those early results in terms of recruiting. I believe they had the number one quarterback prospect on the market commit to USC almost simultaneously with Lincoln Riley being announced as head coach. Yep. We're already starting to see that USC is one of those programs that's always within three years of being a national championship relevant performer. And Lincoln Riley going there, you talk about just changing the power dynamics. Even if he doesn't necessarily get the best recruits this first year, he's dynamic enough as a play caller. But like I said, I I think it's not insane to think that USC could be an eight to nine win team right out the gate. Uh, LSU, on the other hand, I think Brian Kelly, less schematic, more recruiting in terms of how he succeeds. Now he has the opportunity to talk to some Louisiana products and more Southern based products. I'm curious to see how he transitions from recruiting in the Midwest to recruiting in the South. I think obviously not having to get over the academic gatekeeper at Notre Dame is going to be a huge advantage to him. And again, we just literally saw LSU win a national title out of nowhere two years ago. They could right away just jump into being relevant. I, for one, see his first year there be maybe being about a seven win year, but mm-hmm. maybe next year we are already talking about LSU being a national title again. Yeah. And I, I think the academic standard thing is something that's very real, even if it's uncomfortable to talk about because of all the stuff that is also associated with Notre Dame and how Notre Dame has always been always like pretentious, I guess, but people love to hate Notre Dame because Notre Dame has this national fan base the same way people love to hate Texas because Texas is very pretentious. And at the same time, this is going to be a competitive advantage for Brian Kelly that probably takes a little bit longer than it does with Lincoln Riley. Like you you talked about next year being able to compete and that will be determined on how terrible the Pac-12 is next year, like how the Pac-12 continues to be mediocre all the time. That'll be the determination there because 25% of their conference games are against Colorado, California, and Arizona. So yeah, that that makes your life perennial underperformer. Chip Kelly, who knows he might be gone too. So another guy out of that as far as coaching uh, matchups there. So Lincoln's just instantly in a position of power there. No, the the conference is not good. But to, to exactly what we were talking about with Lincoln before, in the transfer portal era and in that conference with those resources, within two years, USC can make a college football playoff because as we saw this year there's still a willingness to put one loss 
Pac-12 teams into the playoff. It's only happened twice in seven years, if I remember correctly. So you had the Mariota Oregon team and you had the, the weird Washington team in 2016 that made the playoff and lost to Alabama. I think those are the only two in seven years, but there's at least a willingness to put one lost Pac-12 teams into the college football playoff. And so Lincoln Riley in that conference with a five-star quarterback, a five-star running back, I believe a four-star linebacker. I can't remember which one it was, who had committed to Oklahoma, decommitted, and is expected soon to commit to USC. Bringing the Oklahoma recruits to Southern California, recruiting the West Coast base, that can get them to one loss conference champion level, probably within two years, because that it is really hard to make that climb from being four and eight to being one loss. It usually doesn't happen year over year, even under the best of circumstances, because you have to replace all of the Clay Helton holdovers that are now seniors and juniors, and you bring in maybe your own recruits, et cetera. And transfer portal will speed up that process a little bit. So I'd say two years, they can realistically compete for at least a college football playoff spot, which is basically to say within two years, they can get to where Lincoln was with Oklahoma back when Jalen Hurts was there in 2019. Exactly. And then to, again, to mention the parallels between the SEC and the Pac-12, where you talk about the potential of being a one-loss Pac-12 team and still making it just in general, being able to go against the also rands of that conference and just get those easy victories, whereas there's no easy victories in the SEC week to week. Obviously, see with Alabama this year, A&M can knock you off in a given week. Ole Miss can knock you off in a given week. Tennessee, there's just so many trap doors to go through in the SEC conference moving forward that Oklahoma, I'm going to be so intrigued what happens there. They're talking about like a Matt Campbell, like you said, to kind of like keep that Big 12 continuity. Um, but they're going to want to make a splash. I've heard them say they want to poach like Lane Kiffin, which Lane Kiffin, I know, is also being talked about for Miami. (laughs) I feel like Lane is such a unique head coach because I feel like he's been a head coach at what, like five programs over the last decade, it feels like, because he had yeah. FAU, he had obviously we've, Ole we've Miss, done this USC. podcast before. We, we've done yeah. this podcast before on Take It Easy, is that Lane Kiffin rose through the rankings so young that he's now gone through a full career, then disgraced, gone on the rehab tour to rebuild his image, and is now desirable for big time programs again, and he's still only like 45 years old. Like he's had three careers in one and he's only like 45 at this point because he does jump from job to job to job. It kind of feels like that more than reality actually is because Al Davis fired him after one year and then he only spent like one year at Tennessee. But even still, Ole Miss was never the permanent landing spot for him. I really want to see what Notre Dame fans would do if they hired Lane Kiffin because that would be (laughs) such an odd hire just from a personality to school standpoint. Point, but I'm kind of with you there in terms of it would be a fun possibility. He does feel like a Miami guy. Could Lane make Miami a national title contender? I mean, if he's able to make Ole Miss a 10 and 2 school on the precipice of it, if you're a 10 and 2 school in the SEC, put that in the ACC conference. Like, what's kind of that quick development? Does Clemson continue to fall off and you're able to bring Miami back to national relevance? Mm. The Miami one feels like a similar case to USC where it is possible. I think we trust Lincoln Riley more than Lane Kiffin just because we've seen the results. But at the very least, it is possible because that conference is not very good. Uh, the ACC Coastal is really bad. Like it's it's kind of pathetic how bad the ACC Coastal has been over the last decade plus. The last quarterback to win an ACC championship in the ACC Coastal was Tyrod Taylor back in 2009. So it's been a long road of being terrible there. But Miami can at least get close. And I think that's that's a victory for them is if they get to where Ole Miss is now, where they're going to go play in an Orange Bowl or they're going to go play in a Peach Bowl. I think that's more realistic for whoever takes that job than it is for USC where you're like, oh, that team can go to the college football playoff pretty quickly just because of the resources in that conference and the recruits that we're already seeing move over in Lincoln Riley's past success. See, I wonder who can cut a bigger check between Notre Dame and Oklahoma uh, this coming like coaching season, because I I think that's part of the equation. I feel like Notre Dame 
relies on culture a little bit more than Oklahoma. I feel like Oklahoma could be very versatile in the type of coach that they bring into that program and still have success. Whereas I feel as though Notre Dame, you almost need a prototype of like what that coach looks like for you. Going from I would say Charlie though, Weiss to Brian Kelly, obviously it, you had... Um, who holds before that? In the case of Notre Dame, though, Brian Kelly was there for so long and they had a sustained level of success where they're winning like 10, 11, nine games every year that we forget like right before that, Notre Dame went through one, two, three, four, five different coaches within about 15 years prior to Brian Kelly getting there. Notre Dame treads through coaches quite quickly and I don't know if that trend will continue or if they find that one guy again, if they get the coach that keeps the train rolling a little bit, or at least that's kind of what some teams have when they try and hire in these quick situations. Like maybe they hire a defensive coordinator, maybe they hire fickle. I don't know if the, the like cutting the check thing is, is as relevant for Oklahoma or Notre Dame. Cause I don't, it doesn't seem like they're going after the same candidates. It doesn't feel like those two schools are really like have anyone they're in a lockstep battle for. So I don't think it's going to be like a Brian Kelly or Lincoln Riley crazy move. I think it's probably going to be close closer to something more traditional that we've seen in college football. And fair because USC and um, LSU had different ways that they had to go through it. They had to pull a guy from a program where they could have been very comfortable with. Brian Kelly could have retired at Notre Dame. Lincoln Riley even though he's very young, could have went his entire coaching career at Oklahoma and been a god there. But no, they had to like literally convince him and throw as much of that blank check money as they could to get him. Whereas, yes, I I guess you could say that Notre Dame is a unique opportunity for an up and coming coach. Oklahoma is a good opportunity for that next up and coming coach. But Oklahoma really hasn't had to do the same coaching hiring in multiple decades, obviously, because Lincoln Riley was on Bob Stoops like staff there. So they were able to just go a easy transition. I, I don't have the name off the top of my head, but the defensive coordinator for Notre Dame is the lead candidate. Uh, Marcus Freeman. Marcus yeah. Freeman. Okay. Marcus Freeman being a betting favorite presents the possibility for them to stay internal and kind of like keep that same mindset, that same continuity that's helped them be successful for the last few years. Whether Marcus Freeman's able to just do a one for one type transition with Brian Kelly is the part that we, you maybe have your questions on. And then you talk about the next guy in line too, in terms of that betting odds, Luke Fickle there for Notre Dame. Luke Fickle is a guy that's shown that he's able to bring obviously a non-Power 5 school into Power 5 relevance in terms of being CFP, which how does that translate? How does that skill set translate? And obviously being Cincinnati, he's recruiting in the Midwest, but does he have the ability to adjust to, again, the academic standards of Notre Dame? Whereas Marcus Freeman probably understands that a little bit more being on those recruiting trips with Brian Kelly. They're close candidates. They both have very impressive resumes from the sense of continuity with Freeman or the ability to make a program like Cincinnati nationally relevant and fickle. I don't know what's the right answer there. I mean, maybe they go more obscure too. Like obviously Oklahoma and LSU shock people with that move. While on the flip side, we kind of knew for a week, Florida was going to hire the the group of five coach that had had a really good run at uh, Louisiana Lafayette. And it was going to be a more traditional hire. I don't know whether Florida is scrambling to find resources or not, but uh, the, the internal hire reminds me of the Miami situation like we were talking about where they hired Manny Diaz to basically just keep the ship rolling when Mark Rick retired and that wasn't necessarily the case because Manny Diaz was his own person and then brought in his own recruits and then by then it was a totally different program so the only thing Marcus Freeman does as a hire is short term trying to keep players from transferring because the tra- that's really all it does and I feel like if that's the reason that they hire Marcus Freeman this is going to fail because you didn't do your full search. Like maybe you luck your way into Marcus Freeman being a good coach. I had never heard of his name until two days ago. So I don't know anything about whether he's qualified or not, or whether or not he was going to be like in contention for the head coaching job at Temple or the head coaching job at, I don't know, SMU or something like that. I don't know if he was a, a hot up and coming candidate until two days ago, but I feel like if that's the only rationale for hiring the coach, it's more likely than not going to fail because even if you keep him as the coach and keep the system in place to try and convince players to stay players 
still might leave. And if some players still leave, you have to try and replace those very quickly with a new recruiting base. And that leads me to think Notre Dame is probably not going to be as good next year as they were this year, simply because if it doesn't work and you don't keep everyone there, Notre Dame becomes a less desirable program to join if you're one of these people. So if that's Notre Dame's thought process and that's why they end up hiring Marcus Freeman, I would be a little bit concerned for Notre Dame and just Marcus Freeman's success because that's an impossible situation to inherit is not only being the head coach at Notre Dame, but also you're only there to try and do damage control. And usually those situations, the coaches end up being fired anyways in two or three years when all they're hired to do is damage control. Oh, I better. I'm naming you the Notre Dame AD. Who are you hiring? Uh... Can I, <laughs> I know this guy's not available possibly right now, but uh, can, can I get PJ Fleck? Can I get him just shoving oars up his butt over at Minnesota? I'd like that guy being my head coach anytime what? I get a hire. What is this Yeah, story? this guy, This no, it's not, he doesn't actually do that, but this guy's okay. really obsessed. This guy's really obsessed with rowing the boat and he always has oars everywhere. This guy's really, really obsessed with rowing boats. He's the former Western Michigan coach. Uh, he just signed a gigantic extension. So yeah. Yeah, I'd love I'd love him to just come into a press conference to just smack me over the head with a paddle. And I'm like, yep, that's my coach. Uh, no, in, in actuality, Matt Campbell is too qualified to be the Notre Dame head coach. So if you can hire Matt Campbell, you should. That would be my first guess there because the job he's done at Iowa State over the past five years makes it so that he's qualified to get the LSU job. He's qualified to get an NFL head coaching job. Like he is one of the best coaches available right now that is at a job that he's at too small of a job for what he's done already. So Matt Campbell might be too good for Notre Dame, but I'm definitely asking if Matt Campbell can get there. If not, go down the line of the coaches at other schools like Jeff Brom at Purdue. Obviously Fickle is a, has proven success in the past. Just go down the line of coaches that have shown success at other Power 5 programs and hire one of those. Might be safe might not but if I'm Notre Dame no if I'm like trying to throw gigantic sums of money at any other coach because I gotta be honest I can't I can't think of any other coach that would be worthy of throwing Brian Kelly or Lincoln Riley sums of money at like is it James Franklin he just signed an extension at Penn State so like you'd really have to throw a lot of money that way like is it Cristobal like I, I'm not as high as Cristobal as other people so yeah that that would be my go-to there is just not throw large sums of money at people just go down the line of the power five coaching candidates okay you have to still make a phone call to urban meyer right i know there was a report that said he's not interested in a college job but you still have to make that phone call if you're notre dame right no 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 you don't sell your soul for urban meyer if you're notre dame you can't sell your soul like that no no not even they can sell their souls for urban meyer you you can't touch that if you're notre dame yeah it is a catholic institution you probably shouldn't sell your soul there okay fair enough well, hopefully, Cincinnati, I'm rooting for you. This last college football poll was announced on Sunday. Hell, reaction video. Should we react to that final CFP poll? I think that's something that uh, we should look into, right? Yeah, for sure. This this will this will be fun and chaotic right before a football Sunday. It always well, is. If there's like a major loss too that we're not expecting, hell, we got to get a video up on that too to break that one down. But yeah. I think that's enough for college football for the day. Hopefully, we'll see. This should be a fun weekend of games. Obviously, Alabama, Georgia. Michigan, Iowa, Oklahoma, Baylor, chaos can ensue. Hopefully Cincinnati doesn't lose to Houston. That's my ultimate nightmare scenario. Cincinnati oh, just loses dang. to Houston I, and just blows it all together for everyone. I forgot about that joke. Gosh, when I when I went for PJ Fleck as the funniest coach, I forgot about Dana Holgerson, who perpetually looks like he's at the sad casino at 6 a.m. just smoking cigarettes and playing blackjack all the time. That's who Notre Dame should hire. They should hire sad Dana Holgerson from Houston. <laughs> It's funny, Houston actually has been relatively consistently good in terms of being a group of five school that no one talks about because obviously we talk about all like Tom Herman's woes at Texas. But I mean, Tom Herman built up Houston into being somewhat of a relevant group of five school and they've kind of remained that status. Well, of course, Cincinnati has been the headliner in their conference. So. Yeah. And guess what? Both of them are on their way to the Big 12 in the next couple of years. Yeah. I'm excited to see what Houston, UCF, Cincinnati do in the Big 12. Like, can they instantly compete for that conference championship? And what does it 
it do? Because I kind of feel as though the Big 12 is going to be a, a still a disrespected conference. So even though they're now technically a power five conference, because they're added to that, they're going to feel like a disrespected conference in the same way we talked about the ACC. Like almost, do you remember when the Big East was a power five conference? Uh, I remember one year where an unranked UConn was playing in the in the Orange Bowl, and I didn't understand why this was the case. They're like, well, the ACC or the, the Big East is always guaranteed a team in the Orange Bowl. I'm like, but why are we putting unranked UConn? <laughs> like, <laughs> apparently they won the conference championship. But yeah, I, I remember the very ends of the Big East. Because it was a big deal when Alex Smith and Utah beat a pit team that was in the Big East, too. I remember that. But either way, that's a whole other rabbit hole. That's the history of college football in these conferences and we'll see how the CFP expansion happens and the playoffs could throw off a whole power dynamic there. Let's get into That's some That's the NFL thing I was going to say. Yeah. But- that's what I was going to say. Let's get into some NFL games. We have a kind of unusual matchup in the sense that not one that you would think would be instantly one we'd want to talk about, but we were looking at this week 13 slate and it kind of stood out for interesting reasons. The Miami Dolphins playing the New York Giants. This game will be in Miami. The Dolphins are a four point favorite. And if no one's been paying attention, the Miami Dolphins are hot right now. They're in a four game winning streak. They have this matchup against the Giants. I believe they have another Jets matchup coming up. And then they play the Saints that have not looked like the same team with Trevor Simeon in the lineup. Albeit, they might have Taysom Hill by that point in the season. But those are three games that they could easily win. So you're talking about, could Miami be on a seven-game winning streak? In fact, with the remaining schedule, they could anywhere win anywhere from nine to ten games. And I believe they're only one win behind the Chargers in the win column right now. Tua's been playing well. He played very efficient in this last game. He was 27 for 31. Jalen Waddle starting to heat up. He's caught multiple touchdowns in the last few weeks and really living up to his draft status. They've gotten performances from their defense. Certainly, they've really stepped up. Um, <laughs> you talk about the Patriots being a good team this year. I think it helps when your quarterback could complete basic fucking passes because Cam Newton, five for 21 with a 5.6 passer rating against this Miami Dolphins defense. They really locked him down. Uh, The Giants come into this one. They come off a win. I think the key there is obviously they are 1-0 without Jason Garrett. So clearly we were in the wrong. David Gettleman, Joe Judge, they had it right. It was all Jason Garrett's fault. (laughs) 1-0 in the Jason Garrett-less era. Played great defense against the Eagles. It had a simple strategy. We're going to make Jalen Hurts throw the ball. And that is not a winning strategy for the Eagles as Jalen Hurts was under 150 passing yards, three interceptions, I think completed less than 50% of his passes. He almost had a Cam Newton-like day, except he got to stay in the game. They have a lot of interesting injuries, though. Adoree Jackson went down in that game. I think they played up just because of Michael Strahan's retirement ceremony. I think that there was a lot of pressure. You know, <laughs> you fire an offensive coordinator, you typically get a team to step up. It's one of those classic NFL motivation type games where the team has some turmoil in the recent week and they just come out and play their best game. You know what? I'm going to defer to you this week because I realized last week when we were going through all the games that I picked first on all of them. I can't let that strategy abide. So Kyle, yeah, I'm going to throw this to you. I'm going to pass that baton. This is a smart strategy considering you're still like three games back at this point. So this is this is a smart strategy on your part. The New York Giants Eagles game, I would like to propose another alternative that it was just bad football. Just all of it was bad football. I, I read off the drive charts on uh, Take It Easy this week and it, w- it was quite bad. I, I don't know if you would like to partake in this, but good Lord, that game was just terrible. Um, but the Giants did win while scoring 13 points. So credit to them on that one. I I will say the fact we have to consider the Giants in the mix still is making me a little bit sad. But all of that to say, this game is all about the Miami Dolphins. It is the Dolphins through and through. They have been the great surprise here of the last, what is it, four weeks now? I guess they they had a bye week before that. So four weeks. They were one and seven for context sake. Yeah, they they were not good. And now they've won games. Tua's look pretty good. Like last week, he game managed his way through through it, but was 22 for 26, which is really, really good. And the Miami Dolphins have found at least a wide receiver one, like at least the shape of a wide receiver one in Jalen Waddle, which is a victory. They're still trotting out Gaskin. Gasecki is still their leading receiver this year, which is hilarious to me. Miami has been pretty good so far. And is Miami going to make the playoffs? No, but Miami is exactly who they should be. And that is the team they 
they've been for the last, what is it now, 13 years? Here is in no particular order the records of the Miami Dolphins over the last 13 years. 10 and 6, 10 and 6, 8 and 8, 8 and 8, 8 and 8, 7 and 9, 7 and 9. 7 and 9, 7 and 9, 6 and 10, 6 and 10, and one 5 and 11 season that netted them to Otago Vailoa. Can I just say, how is it that Jeff Fisher was never hired as head coach at one point for the Miami Dolphins? It would almost fit too perfectly, right? Jeff Fisher's 8 and 8. The Miami Dolphins have hung around 6 and 10 for about 6 and 10 and 7 and 9 for, for a good 15 years now. They haven't won a playoff game since 2000. They, they've been on the long line of just terrible AFC football that has to exist in order for the Patriots, the Chiefs, the Steelers, the Broncos, the Ravens to win all of the championships for 20 years. You got to have some bad teams there. And uh, the Miami Dolphins certainly qualify as one of those because they have not won a playoff game since the year Tom Brady was drafted. All of that to say, the Miami Dolphins are going to win this week against the New York Giants. They're going to get to six and seven. We can finally stop the fire Brian Flores train because it's just kind of idiotic that we, people were trying to fire Brian Flores early on in the season. Hey, considering- one seven. I mean, you lost to the Jaguars it was looking pretty ugly there at one point this is true but if you fire Brian Flores who are you going to hire that's better than Brian Flores hey I gave you the name Jeff Fisher man come on (laughs) Jeff Jeff Fisher's busy he's gonna go coach the University of Tennessee in the next next few years because uh, Josh Heupel is going to go to Oklahoma coming up right now. So uh, anyways, yeah, Jeff, Jeff Fisher down in Miami. Let's do that instead of Brian Flores. Uh, Yes. I'm glad that Brian Flores is still going to be employed with the dolphins because he's done a great job in not being awful with the dolphins. Dolphins fans have obviously been talking about moving on from Tua Tagovailoa ever since they drafted him. It's always been the stepping stone there. Dolphins fans do love Tua, but they, they kind of recognize, and this is something I talked about earlier this week is that we, if we take two of Tagovailoa for what he's not, it's going to be a little easier to figure out what he is because he's played like a full season's worth of games now. It's hard to pin down exactly what Tua Tagovailoa is as a quarterback. He seems to be quite accurate at times and also has interception problems. So he's a game built on accuracy, but he's not as accurate as his counterparts who are starters in the NFL, which sets him up to be like Teddy Bridgewater or Jameis Winston on the Saints or someone who just kind of gets you by as a quarterback and then he has great games like the one he had last week against the Panthers albeit the Panthers aren't the greatest defense in the world but they have a pretty good passing defense this year and he he completes a lot of passes and we've seen moments here and there from Tua the numbers suggest that he's at least a a slightly below average quarterback in the starting quarterback in the NFL and the Dolphins obviously invested a lot in him so we don't know exactly what he is but we kind of know what he isn't at this point and Maybe that helps us better understand what Tua is because he's probably been the most confusing of the young quarterbacks that have been drafted in the last three or so years. Like we kind of know Kyler Murray, he's really good at football. We kind of know Joe Burrow is going to be at the very least a very good quarterback. Justin Herbert, we've seen flashes of him being special. Jalen Hurts, not actually that good. I feel very confident in saying Jalen Hurts, not actually that good of a quarterback. Yeah. Tua is the one where I'm just like, I don't know. I just don't know what to do with them. I think part of the problem is just he's a top five quarterback, right? Because you draft someone top five, you don't want left-handed Sam Bradford. That's exactly or pick kind of one like... pick before Justin Herbert. <laughs> exactly. And Justin Herbert, that's a whole other discussion, actually, that I have some interesting cliff notes behind. But Tua has been playing well. And you give him that, you give him that he's been keeping this ship afloat for the Miami Dolphins and their playoff hopes. And they're not dead yet. Obviously, they very much still can still a playoff spot. Uh, even having to come back from four games down or having to come back with a seven game winning streak like they could like I said potentially be on by the end of this I think they also have their bye week mixed in there the Dolphins are in a good position you just hope that this defense could keep up the pressure keep up the performances that they've been giving them because their defense was a liability early on in the season they had a run defense that was comparably bad to the Chargers run defense early in the season but they've really tied in that ship and then you look at this particular game obviously the Giants offense doesn't scare you Saquon still is having a rough year 
Nate Solder has been an overpaid dud for them that I think Jalen Phillips is just going to abuse this weekend. That's why, easy, the Dolphins are a win here too for me. I, I, we're aligned here very much in agreement on this pick. We just want to talk about it because we want to give the Dolphins a little bit of shine at this point because they deserve it. They've been playing well. And there's certain teams that as we kind of get into the heat of the playoff picture that we kind of ignore. I don't think we've talked much Lions on this podcast, much Jags on this podcast. Yeah. We haven't talked much Washington football team on this podcast, but certainly the Dolphins have been one of those most overlooked squads. So I, I think it was important to kind of give some recognition here because the last time we did talk about them, like you mentioned, we we're talking about the Brian Flores situation. We we're talking about Tua. It was pre-trade deadline. So with the conversation of should the Dolphins move on from Tua for Deshaun Watson was in discussion. Now it just seems like they have at least a commitment form for the rest of the season. And if they can still play a spot, that's going to present a whole other case of issues for them in the sense of, well, how do we build out this roster from this point forward? Hey, they've been finally giving Miles Scott in the rock more and that's paid off well for them too so that's been a good change for them and i think that's why the dolphins have been succeeding run the ball play efficient 27 for 31 you can't play more efficient than that i guess you could go 31 for 31 but that's you know a little it's bit good too enough. high of yeah, expectations. If, you can, if you can do that you're doing great i didn't realize he had five extra completions in garbage time i stopped watching around 22 for 26 so yeah good, good on tua for finishing that game off strong he had <laughs> I guess it's funny to think about this. He had four incompletions while Cam had five total completions. Yeah, no, Cam Newton, Cam Newton, it looks like it hurts every time he throws it. Every time Cam Newton throws, it looks like he's in so much pain. See, and this is why when you watch the Patriots last year and people were like, oh, you know, Cam, why, why can't he find a job? It was so bad watching Cam Newton play football. I do not blame the Patriots at all from making that move. Clearly the results have paid off there. Maybe we should just transition into that game then talking about the Patriots and Bills, because obviously that has huge playoff implications there. The Patriots right now are, I think, what? behind the Ravens for the lead in the conference. But yeah, they're half game behind them right now. I think they still have a bye week upcoming. But the AFC East has been personified by huge winning streaks because the Dolphins have a four game winning streak while the Patriots decided let's just have a six game winning streak. They had that one and three start and just have not looked back from it. And I think that that's just reminders that Bill Belichick treats September is almost an additional preseason, how he kind of used to build those championship rosters in the past of those championship seasons. We always used to have the, are the Patriots done narrative in September? And then, well, look what happened in October. Look what happened in November. Undefeated November there, by the way, for the Patriots and almost undefeated October. The last time they lost was the Nick Folk kick that went off the upright against Brady. That was that was the last time they lost. They, they've just looked so impressive, but they're going against this uh, Bills team. So the Bills thought that the conference and the division was just theirs for the next decade. They didn't expect the Patriots were just going to stick around with the hoodie and Mac Jones was going to be the second coming of Tom Brady here. They played on Thanksgiving, so they had a mini break there. So they have a little bit more time to prepare for this game. What it's going to come down to is just Josh Allen has to be dependable because you look at the games in which he struggled, the Bills struggled. The Bills cannot recover when Josh Allen has a bad game. It's so clear that their success is tied to him because they don't really have much of a running game to speak of Devin Singletary and Matt Breda these guys just can't get it done when Josh Allen isn't being efficient he's their best running back almost in a way too and then their defense took a huge blow because Tredavious White out for the year with an ACL Tredavious White has been described as someone who could literally just take away one side of the football field from you going against the Patriots and obviously the Patriots game plan is take away what you do well and if you can take away Josh Allen that's a huge benefit to them obviously Bill has done a great job on Josh Allen actually throughout his career when you really look at Josh Allen's games against the Patriots they mm -hmm. could have lost last year to a bad Cam Newton team I think that game came down to a fumble late by Cam twice yeah. both of the games were close last year yeah so now with an improved Patriots team this is going to be a dog fight to the very end Kyle like I said deferring to you on this pick well, let's do the analysis first and save the pick so that Juju can can mull over his, his options here. And I've been thinking about this game actually for going back to last Thursday because I did a podcast with our buddy Blake Jude over on Take It Easy talking about the, both the Bills and the Patriots. And one of the things I thought about is whenever we do this matchup, I always think about is what are the Patriots doing to, to counter the other teams? Whenever I think of whether the Patriots are going to win a matchup or not, it's always what will Bill Belichick do to to scheme against this team or what will Josh McDaniels do? Or if you go back a couple of years, what will Tom Brady do against this? And I think that's just more so to, 
to how good the Patriots have been. As I started thinking more about this game, I started thinking, well, the best player on the field is Josh Allen. Both sides, whoever's coming into this. Now you can argue Belichick works like a, a player just on the sidelines because Belichick works in mysterious ways and he studies film differently and he's just one of the smartest defensive minds, if not the smartest defensive mind in the history of football. So maybe that counteracts that, but Josh Allen is the best player on the field for both sides coming into this game and I it's been a weird year for Josh Allen so far and yet even still I think if he makes some of the plays Buffalo should be able to win this game pretty handily because the Patriots are going to try and dominate time of possession the way the Patriots do especially with the the three-way running game that they've had this year I mean Tredavious White leaving now changes the math but throughout the season Buffalo's rush defense has been worse than their passing defense by a pretty big margin so you can run the ball better on Buffalo than you can throwing so the Patriots will probably take advantage of that just because why would you throw the ball more against a defense that's good at defending the pass but not as good at defending the run so that leads me to think Josh Allen plays are going to be the difference in this game and I I've been framed as a Josh Allen hater because obviously on this podcast was the first place I displayed the awful take last year that uh, Josh Allen would go six and ten and be replaced by I believe Dak Prescott I said at the time but Josh Allen has come around and Josh Allen's like a tier two level quarterback he does everything Mahomes Holmes does, but slightly worse. And that's totally okay. Like that still makes him the best player on the field in a matchup between two division leaders. And so I think I'm going to go with the Buffalo Bills and I'm I'm scared to take the Buffalo Bills because the Patriots have been a team that I think is legitimately good. Maybe not elite, but legitimately good. Both these teams feel like pretty much even. I think Buffalo is a three point favorite for that reason. And it's in Buffalo. And they usually say the home team gets a three point swing, which is probably not as true as it used to be, but this game feels like such a coin flip. I want to give Josh Allen maybe an unearned benefit of the doubt relative to 20 years of seeing Bill Belichick break my heart. Um, But now I love Bill Belichick and I've been reading this wonderful book by Seth Wickersham about the Brady Belichick era. And I'm pretty sure, pretty sure the reason it happened was both of them. I don't think there's a Brady Belichick debate here. Pretty sure, pretty sure it was both of them was the reason that happened. So I'm, I'm giving Bill Belichick the opportunity to, to break my heart again. Well, as we're staring down the gun barrel of a potential Brady Belichick Super Bowl. Obviously, it's going to take a lot of wins to get there from both teams. And that is why I'm going to counter you and we're going to be against each other on this one because I am going to take the Patriots. I'm just going to go against Josh Allen's history against the Patriots. Like I mentioned, he has struggled against Bill. I just pulled up his numbers now. 56% completion percentage, seven to six touchdown to interception ratio, passer rating of 77. He's looked bad in these matchups. And if you ask me, how did the Patriots win game? Uh, solid run game, win the turnover back. I could see Josh Allen making a stupid turnover in this game. I could see him trying to escape the pocket, do too much, and have a horrible fumble. Meanwhile, on the other side, you have a team that's just not going to beat itself. The Patriots' Mac Jones, he's been top five in completion percentage, top five graded PFF quarterback, top five almost everything over the last five weeks for the Patriots. Mac Jones has been really good for this team. He just doesn't beat himself. And they have it going with Damian Harris. They got it going with Rondre Stevenson. And no Tredavious White. I, I just think that that's a lot for that Bills defense to have to absorb. Like I said, you're talking about a guy who literally just took away one side of the field from you. Now that's going to put a lot more pressure on Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer in this game to have to add a little bit more help to the side of Levi Wallace in that game. Not that the Patriots particularly beat you with their outside wide receivers, but they like to exploit matchups. And I think that they're going to see a guy who hasn't been starting the entirety of the year and is not nearly as good as White, and they're going to try and take advantage of that. That's why... Yeah, I just see the Patriots rolling into town. I do see this potentially ending up in a split. So we'll revisit this game when we have to talk about the rematch. And I could see me potentially taking the Bills in that respect. But going to this game, just everything's been lining up. I I think, too, the Patriots have been the leaders in point differential over the last several weeks, which used to be a category in which the Bills were leading. So it just tells you that they're not just winning games. They're kicking teams' asses. Tennessee didn't even look like they deserved to be on the same field as them this past weekend. Patriots are hot. Bills are good too. A compelling AFC East 
picture that I just give the benefit of the doubt to New England at this point. I could just I see do, them not doing well themselves. in that respect. I, I think New England is a better team altogether than Buffalo. I'm interested also to, to put a final bow on this. How aggressive do the Bills play against McCorkle, which is obviously Mac Jones? How aggressive do they decide to play in the secondary? Are they trying to jump routes? Are they going to try and intercept Mac Jones? Are they going to try and force him into mistakes? Which, as much as we do give credit to, to Mac Jones this year for how he's kind of changed, it, are, he's kind of been the same person that he was at Alabama in terms of protecting the ball. And in this win streak, he's only had, I believe, two or three interceptions in the entire time. Before that, we did see some turnover concerns with Mac Jones. And so if a defense jumps it, it's similar to like Kirk Cousins, where even when you play well consistently, we still know the turnover game is somewhere in there. So how aggressive does Buffalo play against Mac Jones? And will Belichick allow Mac Jones to make the big plays to win the way he's done against bad defenses over the last two weeks? Yeah, they're going to need a little bit more production from Rousseau and Oliver on that defensive line for the Bills to be able to get more aggressive on defense. They got it in the Saints game. So hopefully that transfers over from Thanksgiving. Like I said, they had a mini break here. They had a mini buy playing on that Thanksgiving day. So at least maybe a couple more days to use that to your advantage, get ahead on looking up Patriots game film. So maybe they see something that we're not currently seeing. I feel like at this point, Belichick sees everything. He's that all seeing eye. He's big brother over the NFL, which I guess is probably pretty literal considering he's been involved in multiple Spygate scandals at this point in his career. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. We have a really good next game. We've actually had this game bookmarked for weeks. I, I said it weeks ago that we were going to talk about this game when it came up. The Los Angeles Chargers and the Cincinnati Bengals. At this point in time, the Bengals are a three-point favorite at home. And I'll just start off by saying, how exciting is it that we literally on this podcast in week 13 are talking about all three of our sophomore quarterbacks from the 2020 draft class in a potential playoff picture? I think that's really cool when we get to see the youth of the NFL really shine and have a legitimate chance at a playoff picture when it comes to Herbert, Tua, and Burrow all keeping their teams in games to win and potentially make it into January football, even though I guess technically every team makes it in January football now because we do have an extended season. So mid-January football, I should say. You know, this game, I think, has a multitude of factors going into it that aren't very good for the Chargers. For one, they've lost five of their last seven games. They struggled against the Broncos. And people are starting to look at Brandon Staley. I mentioned it. I floated the possibility of it a couple weeks ago. Was Brandon Staley the right guy? As a defensive coordinator, you would expect that his defense just to not be so pissed poor against the run and the fact that they allow almost 10 more yards per game running attack than the next bat worst team just shows that a guy like Joe Mixon should be able to tear them apart Joe Mixon is coming off a great game I think he had 160 rushing yards in the Bengals last win this past weekend and then you just talk about these personnel decisions too I know Chargers Twitter has just been ripping him apart for his decision to start Senio Calamente on the offense line at one point <laughs> I believe this guy had a zero PFF grade for pass blocking. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Five pressures allowed, basically just getting eaten alive out there. And they even had the benefit of Teddy Bridgewater getting hurt in that game and still couldn't really get it done. So the Chargers are really in a state of struggling at this point. You know, too, another disappointing thing, Kenneth Murray, their first rounder from last year, their second first rounder behind Herbert, he had 10 total snaps against the Broncos. You just hate to see that from a guy that you drafted so high and put so much capital. And I know again, that I guess that's not Brandon Staley's draft pick there. That's from the previous regime, but still you have to be able to use the guys when they're a elite level prospect like Murray was. And to hear that he's basically a backup edge rusher at this point is very concerning very concerning for this entire defense that the only ones you could really count on consistently are going to be Derwin James, Bosa and Kaiser White. Yeah. This, this has been, a story that I kind of focused in on this week, which was not great because back when the Chargers were four and one, I talked about how they were building a team similarly to how the Saints built their team a couple years ago. And the thing that that reminded me of, especially now, is that the Chargers just lack talent. At its base level, the Chargers have a lot of holes on their team. And that's something that makes me feel like this is due for some kind of a fall off towards the end of the season. Uh, after 
Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen, and Mike Williams. And by the way, Mike Williams is still a free agent at the end of this season. Can you name the next weapon on the Chargers, the next best skill position player on the Chargers? I would say I probably give Jared Cook the benefit of the doubt. And they have used their tight ends. They've used Parnum and they've used Cook, particularly a bunch in the offense recently. But the wide receivers, I hear what you're talking about. That's why there was discussions. Should they be involved in the Odell Beckham situation? Because behind them, you have a bunch of young guys Guys like uh, Guyton, I believe, is one of the receivers mm-hmm. there who has the, that's the name year. I was looking for, and Jordan Guyton Palmer, too, name. a rookie. Yeah, exactly. Like, those are the funny names Parnum and, and Guyton were the funny names I was looking for in that analysis because it's it's not been great. And they've been really, really bad at stopping the run this year on defense. Uh, Linval Joseph has pretty much, he's got nothing left at this point for the Chargers. Obviously, you talked about Kenneth Murray being the, the middle linebacker, the inside linebacker. Uh, first Adderley's round pick. Been bad. Yep. Adderley had a great start to the year, and then he's fallen off heart, which seems to be kind of the theme for the Chargers, right? Players that started off super hot, and now they've fallen off. Uh, the only thing that gives you pause for hope if you're the Chargers is that you have that golden arm quarterback and golden hair quarterback that can and maybe make up for some of those problems, but it's a lot of problems and the chargers are going to have to, I mean, they did fix the offensive line for the most part. Obviously you talked about Staley and the decisions of how he's playing that offensive line, but that feels like it's been resolved. And it's like a one step forward, two steps back thing. Cause now they've got like so many questions on defense, not enough skill position players. Like it's, it's been really rough. So for that reason, I'm taking the Bengals uh, to win this week because it feels like if you're looking at the Bengals roster, Last year, I feel dumb for not recognizing how much talent they did actually have early on when I said the Bengals were not a playoff team this year. Because Cincinnati, uh, like close to the Patriots, they hit on a lot of those free agent signings this year. Obviously, Trey Hendrickson has had a sack in seven straight games, and that's the one that everyone has talked about a lot there. But they have been fantastic this year. The offensive line is at least stable now instead of one of the worst offensive lines in the history of the NFL. I know Quentin Spain, I think, is going to be back this week. I think he was out with injury earlier. I can't remember if it was Quentin Spain or the other guard whose name I forgot now, but one I'll throw to you right away. Riley Reef was banged up in this last game. He's dealing with an ankle injury. So having your right tackle injured against Joey Bosa isn't exactly ideal. Yeah, that's a, that's a big part of that too. And they've been trying to get Jonah Williams back. Cause again, it's like they had two first round picks last year. Cause they get Jonah Williams back. They get Joe Burrow, obviously. And it's, it's something that can help out for the Bengals. They spent a second round pick on a guard that's okay I, I forgot what his name is now it's uh, uh anyways they spent a second round pick on a guard this year in the draft and they weren't super excited about it but he's been fine they've at least they've stabilized the offensive line enough the Bengals have a lot of talent enough talent to compete in the division no because the Ravens have Lamar Jackson but enough talent to make the wild card yes and that'll begin this week with a victory against the <laughs> Los Angeles Chargers see you're gonna piss off some Bengals fans from that perspective because enough to compete with the Ravens they didn't kick the Ravens ass literally just three weeks ago so they clearly can compete with the Ravens on any given Sunday but I'm with you I'm aligned because I I just don't see how the Chargers are stopping Joe Mixon if the Bengals are able to get the running game going and just make things easy shorten the game script for Joe Burrow I don't see how their offense is game contained and then as far as defensively so we mentioned the struggles of the Chargers offensive line you mentioned Trey Hendrickson that seven straight game stat I was actually about to drop that too as my factoid so thanks Kyle for stealing my analysis there but 10.5 sacks on the year overall so a great free agent acquisition also game production from bj hill i think i figured out the game script for justin herbert i think i figured out his struggles think about the defensive coordinators in those five losses or the defensive play callers in the five losses that the chargers have mike zimmer bill balichek vic fangio wink martindale dan quinn if you were going to lose five games or have a sophomore quarterback struggle in five games you would say those are the coordinators or defensive play callers that those would come against. Now, I guess the Bengals, they face Lou Anarumo, which this is his first defensive coordinator job. He's been the coordinator for the Bengals for the last three years, but this is his first full-time defensive coordinator job. So he doesn't have quite the sweat equity that those other names listed have. So Herbert could potentially have a rebound game in the sense that doesn't necessarily have those struggles. 
But we also have seen the Chargers struggle to do this East Coast swing because this game is going to be in Cincinnati. I don't know what the weather forecast is, but we are starting to creep up. Hell, we're in December. We're in December now. So you tell me a Southern California team that plays inside a dome going to a tough northern city like Cincinnati doesn't really sound like great odds for them, does it? Especially when they've been struggling as much as they have been offensively. And no, the I, I Bengals used to are more be, physical. I used to be a Chargers fan many, many moons ago back when they were in my hometown of San Diego and every time someone mentioned the the warm weather team going to a cold weather city I got so mad I hated it every time someone brought that up because I'm like <laughs> I mean we went into Cincinnati and won a playoff game in 2013 and you all want to keep talking to us we we've been into Denver and won games in December like we we can we can play with the best of them in San not Diego not with this construct of a team you you need a physical power running with Danian Tomlinson in your backfield. And I love Austin Eckler, but you ain't that guy, pal. You're not yep, that guy. That's totally fair. Uh, I guess Joshua Kelly, is that your go-to? But he's also from UCLA. So that's a Southern California Larry running back. Roundtree. That, yep. You talk about those weird names, skill position players on the Chargers. Uh, Larry Roundtree takes the cake for that entire squad for me, honestly. Yeah, I, I'm half expecting a Kalen Balaj to pull up at some point for the Chargers this week. Well, this is big for the Chargers. If they lose this one, then they're 6-6 six and six and lose six of their last eight games at that point. Yeah. Literally now. Now they have a tiebreaker loss against the Broncos. I know we want to discount the Broncos existing, but now they've kicked the Cowboys ass and they've kicked the Chargers ass in two of the last three weeks. So the yeah. Chargers, the Broncos aren't dead. You still have um, the Browns hanging around that playoff picture. You still the Steelers have the Steelers are five, somewhat five alive one. there. At least the Chargers <laughs> have the tiebreaker there. And then of course you want to pretend the Miami Dolphins still have a chance to make the playoffs. I want to pretend from a narrative standpoint, Kyle. <laughs> Give a little bit of more value to the podcast and the listener's experience. At, at the Maybe risk we have a of sound down in like... Miami, that's like, man, these guys get me. No, Juju, Peace Juju's your ally on this one. Because as much as I love playing the Miami Dolphins fight song on our podcast and rallying behind this team, the risk of sounding like being wrong about Michigan and Cincinnati again, uh, there there is a zero percent chance the Miami Dolphins are making the playoffs this year. <laughs> hey, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take, Wayne Gretzky. Michael Scott, get it. <laughs> yeah, we'll save this um, yeah, in the archives. But I, I think that that really just covers this game. I'm excited for this game. I do want to give one last shout out to the Bengals here. First time since 2009 that they have swept the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I think that's as good a transition as I need to go into the next game because we're actually going to be talking about the Pittsburgh Steelers versus the Baltimore Ravens. Now, this is one of those rivalries that when both teams are good, even actually, I guess, even when both teams aren't that good, they just always have competitive games with each other. I understand very much why this would have been a desirable Sunday night football game. It ended up being pushed to the mid afternoon game, but I always just think of how physical this matchup is between the Baltimore Ravens and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I expect much of the same. I know that the Steelers have definitely taken their lumps in recent weeks. They were in that shootout game against the Chargers. They end up, tying the Lions and then they got their ass kicked against Cincinnati. Big Ben, you talked about his corpse being rotted, but I will say Big Ben, that prior stretch of games, if you look at like kind of the raw numbers, like touchdown interception ratio, he was doing a good job. It's just the type of football you need to play. Everything needs to go right offensively for you to win with this current iteration of Big Ben. They really didn't get Najee Harris involved in the game against the Bengals, which I guess is hard when you're trailing. It's really impossible to get a guy like Najee Harris involved aside from from a pass catching standpoint and even then they weren't able to really do that the defense I know TJ Watt got hit with COVID too so I don't know if he's going to be available for them this coming game do we have an update on TJ Watt have you heard anything well I know he's also battling other injuries but yeah no he's in the COVID protocol right now we probably won't know until later in the week because I think he's vaccinated so that I helps. think I think there's negative or not negative like certain negative COVID tests that can get him in but yeah we, we don't know at the time of recording okay well that's good to establish I mean the Steelers defense has been kind of an underperforming defense over the last stretch of games here because Devin Bush has not lived up necessarily to his draft pedigree I know obviously he's returning off a season ending injury last year so it was going to be a bit of a different player or a rehab year for Devin Bush but they need more from him they need more from Minka Fitzpatrick Minka has 
been, I believe last week was his first pick of the season. So he hasn't been that game changer that he was when he first came on the Steelers and was just forcing turnovers left and right. I know everyone wants to talk about the Steelers, that 9-0 and stretch from last year, and they just haven't looked like the same team since. Now they've been an average team, which I guess if you know Mike Tomlin wants Ooh. to defend his record of being a 500 head coach or at least maintaining his team as a winning team that's great i just you look at their stretch of games the remaining schedule it doesn't look pretty now baltimore in this last game they don't look pretty for them either they've had their ups and downs throughout the season they could have lost to detroit they could have easily lost that game against the browns when lamar jackson's turning over the ball left and right he was just lucky he was going against baker mayfield who was doing much of the same what type of baltimore team are we getting they've been up and down and all around this season kyle what you got on this game would you like to know the official record of the Pittsburgh Steelers since the 11 and 0 start now? And also, I would like to note that the Chargers game where they scored 27 points in the fourth quarter, that is the only one of those games other than the playoff game against the Browns that they scored more than 30 points in the entire game. So that is uh, the longest stretch now that was previously held by the Miami Dolphins until a couple weeks ago was the Pittsburgh Steelers longest number. I think the next closest was like 10 games. But in that stretch, the Pittsburgh Steelers since starting 11-0, 6, 10, and 1 are the Pittsburgh Steelers so they have fallen on hard times to below average football Um, this would be a game that under normal circumstances Baltimore just absolutely kicks ass just dominates Pittsburgh the problem is the same problem we talked about last week when we were talking about the Browns game and two weeks before when we talked about the Ravens they have had so many injuries this year and yet still Lamar Jackson is so unbelievably good and unbelievably gifted that he is carrying them to the number one seed in the AFC because they've lost Marcus Peters they've had Marlon Humphrey gone for parts of the season all of their running backs gone future Hall of Fame potential left tackle Ronnie Stanley out for the year for the second year in a row. Alejandro Villanueva just absolutely washed. And even still, the Baltimore Ravens keep finding ways to stay just good enough. Like obviously the the Lions game they should have lost and the Browns game uh, was the first time in seven years that a quarterback threw four interceptions and still won an NFL game. I believe they were like 0-52 before that. So obviously they're winning fluky games. It's the reason why I feel like this game is properly set at like four points in favor of Baltimore. Baltimore because Baltimore with all the injuries this year is a slightly above average NFL team that if they played in a strong division they might be a wild card team again this year similarly to last year where we didn't view Baltimore as a Super Bowl caliber team in 2020 we did view them that way in 2019 when everyone was healthy and Lamar Jackson won the MVP best of circumstances yes they've just been hit real hard with injuries this year I'm still going to take Baltimore to win this game uh, because I have literally no faith in the Pittsburgh Steelers at all Baltimore this year I know we talk about the physical running game we always just assume Baltimore has a good defense Baltimore is ranked 24th in the NFL in team DVOA there is no team with more than seven wins that has a worse defense this year than the Baltimore Ravens according to football outsiders DVOA statistics so it's been rough sledding for Baltimore this year injuries have just knocked them out big time it'll come back to bite them in the playoffs and once they play better teams they'll start to get exposed but they can use kind of the same strategy they used last week of just not respecting the passing game at all totally focus on the run focus all your defensive energy on Najee Harris and that's good enough to hold the Browns to 10 points it'll be good enough to hold the Steelers to 17 and uh Baltimore can score 20 points just like that because Lamar Jackson is that special see he is special and I I do love Lamar and the talent but you would say that Lamar Jackson's last two games the last two games that he's actually played have been pretty bad obviously the Miami Dolphins game when we said they were just spamming them with the same rush eight yeah. um, or obviously this game where he has four turnovers he's been able to just do enough to get the team the wins and I have to feel that that's going to catch up with them at some point I mean obviously it yeah. caught up to them in a game against the Bengals where they just got absolutely their ass kicked but do I think the Steelers have the horses to necessarily take advantage that's the problem in this game like I feel as though the Ravens are playing beatable football. They're playing non-winning football and winning games. Can the Steelers just capture whatever magic they had in that 
last half against the Chargers, if they could put up that type of offensive performance in that comeback effort from the start of the game, just get the things going early, they could establish a lead and make it very hard for the Ravens to do what they want to do. Because the Ravens, they've been controlling time of possession all season. I believe they lead the NFL in total time of possession over the course of the season. So you know how they win games. They like to grind it out, get that lead early. It's a home game for the Steelers and they are a four and a half point underdog. I want to agree with you for a lot of the points you mentioned, but I'm actually going to say the Steelers get right. I think that this is a week in which I mean, how they just got beat up over the last couple of weeks. They could have won that Chargers game. They <laughs> got their ass kicked against the Bengals. I think that's motivation, right? Talk about that motivation narrative. I think Mike Tomlin is a great motivator. And I think he just has the ability to look into his guys and to say like, hey guys, come on. That was disgusting, that performance you put on. So I like to believe that idea, but at the same time, the Jaguars are probably motivated and it doesn't matter because at a certain point, they just don't yes, have the talent. Yes, but the Jags, the Jags' talent is so far below the Steelers' talent. Let's be, yeah. let's be frank about that. Even as talent depleted as we think the Steelers are, I mean, certainly their offensive line isn't as vaunted as it once was back in the day. I still like Claypool. I still like Deontay Johnson. Najee Harris is elite. Big Ben, probably like in that 20, the 30 range now at quarterback but he's on the high 20s I would say like I can't name too many other starters I mean is he better than a rookie Trevor Lawrence or a rookie Zach Wilson yeah those ones aren't those ones aren't exactly the fairest because I'm comparing him against the bottom half quarterbacks of the league so I have to compare him off of the 2021 versions he's at least better than those players and then on any given week like I said he actually was playing really well prior to having to sit out that game against the Lions where Mason Rudolph got the surprise start there if he could just on any given day Ben can recapture the magic which I think the Ravens defense while they don't allow many completions like I mentioned last week that they are among the league leaders in completion percentage against they do allow a lot a lot of yards after the catch just get in your playmakers hands like if he could get it to Najee Harris in space or he could get it to Deontay Johnson in space they could do damage against this Baltimore secondary so I think that there are compelling reasons to where I say the Steelers can get right and win this game so hey you know we have to have a little drama on the show we have to go against each other on some picks Someone has to make a cojones pick of the week. And I'm going to say the Pittsburgh Steelers are mine here. Dre, I'm thinking of you with this one. Shout out to our boy Dre, Steelers fan holding on for dear life. He's also a Lakers fan. So basically his fanhood revolves around the AARP of the National Football League and the NBA with both those franchises. Yeah, that's t- totally fair. I-, I actually like this cojones pick. Uh, I- if I were to do this pick uh, somewhere else, I would hedge on this one where uh, I would probably take the uh, the Ravens to win, but then the Steelers at like plus four and a half on the spread so that like there's a chance you win no matter what. Um, and maybe you get the double win of the game being close. But I agree with you on this i i the, the 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 blitzing strategy will work against baltimore because as bad as the steelers offensive line is the ravens offensive line is worse than the pittsburgh steelers offense they are two of the poorest offensive lines in the nfl it's going to catch up to baltimore whenever they play an offense that can take advantage of them if if they whenever they play an offense that can take advantage of them not being able to score points but that is not the Pittsburgh Steelers. Because again, un- until the game where they for some reason scored 27 in the fourth against the Chargers, had not scored more than 30 points in a game since November 11th of 2020. See, it's almost like they have an entire offensive line of Senor Calamentes. Give another roast there. Zero PFF grade. I'm still kind of blown away by that stat. It's Ow. unbelievable. That's unbelievable. <laughs> All right. Well, we have our final game of the week. So we got to close it out here with your homeboy, Patrick Mahomes, as they face the Denver Broncos. Like I said, the Broncos, Listen, you know, there are good reasons why we both agree that the Broncos are very fraudulent. I mean, hell, they are a, what, five, six win team right now currently? Six and five currently. Six and five team. They're a six and five team, and I still have them in the bottom third of my power rankings. That's kind of the respect I've given the Broncos six and five record. And I will take those slings and arrows from fans that will say like, man, why are you underrating the Broncos? It's just, they had that three and O start where they beat three of the worst teams in the league. And now they're just in this weird spot where they are shocking the Cowboys coming off that cap injury for Dak. They're, shocking the Los Angeles Chargers who had all the things going in their direction to win that game. Certainly the talent advantage there. We thought the Chargers were more talented than the Broncos and how the fact Teddy Bridgewater, I mean, I don't know what exactly is going to happen at quarterback for the Broncos too, because 
Bridgewater did get hurt in the Chargers game. He did play in the Chargers game, so he was hurt while playing. So could we see Drew Locke taking snaps throughout this week as we lead up to the game? Who knows? We're recording here on a Wednesday for clerical purposes on how we view this game. Obviously, and you know, I think we're going to be in agreement here. So I, I, I'll let defer to say, just say we're both going to take the Chiefs, right? Yeah obvious yeah yeah no this is this is the chiefs but the broncos can make a statement this was an opportunity for them to make a statement game i i understand why nbc would potentially want this as their game of the week the sunday night game because it's one of the most compelling games certainly when you consider that the broncos are one game out from the chiefs too <laughs> it's it's so weird it, it's, yeah let, let's I just let's not do that let's i know <laughs> it's just it's weird it's been two here's the thing andy read off a of bye week i I guess that's one thing we should also state. (laughs) Andy Reid off a bye week we get in this game. So I got time, boys. (laughs) We're we're just going to get hammered with that statistic to start off the broadcast. And I'm completely okay with it because historically, that's where his bread and butter is. And I should say, like, man, am I saying bread and butter around Andy Reid? Okay. (laughs) You know, come on. He he plays into it. He doubles down on that KFC double down. We all know it. But anyway. I know. I know. No, that's Rex Ryan. I was going to say, oh, let's go get a snack, boys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Andy Reid Andy Reed is the guy who, uh, after winning the Super Bowl, went and got double cheeseburgers. That was that was Andy Reid's thing. See, out of all the games that I put my research into, I, I guess I didn't really put as much effort into this game as like the other games, just because I do have my preconceived bias of what I think of the Chiefs versus the Broncos. I'll admit I have a bias on how I view these teams. And the Chiefs going into the bye week, though, I should be honest about it too. Like that Cowboys Chiefs game was ugly. As a Patrick Mahomes fantasy owner, I can tell you how much Patrick Mahomes has been struggling. It has single-handedly been killing my team. Six points against the Cowboys. Are you kidding me? But yeah, I got him and Derrick Henry, so I'm I'm holding on to a playoff spot for dear life. <laughs> but again, off a of bye, just clean it up. Clyde Edwards Hilaire, another week in which he could get healthy. So maybe you could get the running game going a little bit more. I do think that if there was a list of coordinators or a list of defensive play callers, I talk about Justin Herbert's struggle against veteran defensive coordinators. Vic Fangio can play up the game strategies that Patrick Mahomes has been struggling up as as one of the best in the league i'm sure that he's going to double down on the too high safety approach and that would be where i could see this being a game to add a little bit of intrigue i could see this game being one that you bet the under on because the chiefs offense has been struggling the broncos are going to play it very conservatively offensively and defensively i think this could be one of those games where both teams score low 20s so you would like the broncos at plus 10 because i believe the spread is at 10 points right now which seems seems like a lot on the surface that that's the dis okay But I'm actually surprised Vegas would do that, though, because the Chiefs have been historically bad against the spread for Vegas, unfortunately. A lot of Chiefs betters that take them at minus whatever this season have been really disappointed because they typically don't beat the spread. They've just played in a lot of close ball games, and I could see this one being a close ball game. I think this means that Vegas sees the possibility. Uh, it means a lot of people are betting on the Chiefs, which always happens, and Vegas is moving the line because there's a scenario where this is like a 35 point Chiefs victory I think is probably the part where they're like we're concerned about this being a a catastrophically big win Um, I don't even know if I agree with that yeah there's a scenario it's just the Chiefs haven't been that team this year well they've been that that team very strategically against bad teams when they play bad teams they have been that team because I was joking about this for like six weeks and now they haven't done anything like it in four weeks but for six weeks I was like we keep saying something's wrong with the Chiefs and they're averaging 36 points a game like I feel like that's just we're coming to a point where we've gotten used to the Chiefs playing like that and then like you said ugly win against the Packers ugly win against the Cowboys comeback win against the Giants Uh, I forgot which other game was in there they played oh the one where they blew out the Raiders but that was they also got blown out by Tennessee prior to that stretch that's fair like the Chiefs pre win streak and the Chiefs now are playing two very different games because it's not the fun Chiefs offense like we're used to it's the Chiefs saying okay we're going to win by not turning the ball over if we don't turn the ball over 
there is literally no way that teams can beat us. If, if we just don't have turnovers, if we don't make catastrophic mistakes, none of these teams can beat us. We, we might win 20 to 10. We might win like 27 to 24, but there's no way people can beat us if we don't turn it over and give them opportunities. And to add to that, that's where they've really excelled in this recent stretch of games because their defense is forcing turnovers now. So the fact that their defense is yep. being a very opportunistic defense, and that's really what summarizes the Chiefs' success over the last few years because we keep hammering that they have a bad defense. We all recognize that they're talent depleted compared to other rosters defensively. But what set them apart, particularly in their Super Bowl year, I would say, because that was also another bad defense. They just would get timely sacks or timely turnovers. I think to the Super Bowl, I think about Chris Jones just coming on at the right time to pressure Jimmy Garoppolo or Tyron Matthew making plays down the stretch. That's what summarizes the Chiefs defensively. Uh, Spags is still the defense coordinator for them, correct? Yes, he is still the defensive okay. coordinator. Yeah, so then that, you know, he's kind of one of those guys almost in a Bruce Arians type vein of no risk it, no biscuit, the way he sends blitzes and dials up those packages. As long as they can win the turnover battle, that's a winning strategy for the Chiefs. I mean, it's a winning strategy in general in the NFL. It's just disappointing, obviously, if you're Patrick Mahomes fantasy owner. It's really yeah, disappointing there because you're not going to get those four touchdown, five touchdown pop-off performances like you drafted him for, but that's a different conversation itself. I think this could be a week. Itself. This could, could be a week where you get one of those. It could be, but it's hard for me to... Like, okay, so I mean, I'm going to confer with Drew for the fantasy football podcast, see what his ranking of Patrick Mahomes is this week. But I will tell you, like, if he has him confidently in the top five again, I will be shocked. Mostly because if I was to be objective, completely objective, take out all my biases, take the names off the back of jerseys here, Patrick Mahomes just looking at his numbers from the last few years and looking at his numbers from this year, I would probably have him as the number 10 quarterback, just because I would probably say, okay, historically he's been performing at this level, but has been performing at this level during the course of the season. Take out the biases. Number 10 sounds about right for this level of quarterback, <laughs> you know, um, from, from fantasy perspective. Yeah. From a fantasy perspective, that changes it. And then when you look at everything else that's in there, like advanced numbers, I think Mahomes is like eighth or ninth in, in passer rating this year, which is interesting. Obviously, we know he has all the touchdowns and the interception numbers are higher this year. So that's simple math and simple numbers, but sometimes they do tell a story, especially for people like us who pretend that we know the advanced analytics or I who says double high safeties a lot. And it sounds like it means something. But anyways, it's five or two Y banana. Exactly. Yeah. We throw it out there to make ourselves sound smarter. And my big conclusion from this is the Chiefs are going to win. I'm interested to see how they win, though. The Chiefs are going to win this game, but how is it that they decide that they're going to game plan against the Broncos? Because simply put, I don't disagree with you in the Broncos being like a bottom third team. The difference between 18 and 22 is not that significant. Broncos are just not that talented. The, <laughs> the rest of the season for the Broncos at this point is, uh, if I remember correctly, I believe Chiefs. Chiefs, Raiders, Chargers. There's one more game in there. I forgot what it is now. And then they play the Lions. And I know the Lions seems like an easy yeah. win, but the Lions are looking at their schedule and being like, who can we, we can get the Broncos? We can yeah. get the Broncos. Okay. Well, maybe to give a little bit of more analysis for Broncos fans here, let's look at my power rankings real quick here. So I have the Broncos at 21. I have directly in front of them the Eagles at 20 because we saw that game when we saw the Eagles kick their ass. Then we have Washington at 19, which, okay, if you're a Broncos fan, you say, well, we beat Washington. Well, now Washington's on this three game heater and starting to play really well. So are they playing better ball than the Broncos? That's debatable. I have the Browns ahead of them. The Browns did beat them, but I believe that was the 17 to 10 Case Keenum Thursday night football game. And then I have the Steelers ahead of them and the Steelers, I mean, for the Broncos, it's like, I'm giving the Steelers, I mean, they have somewhat of a comparable record five five and one versus a six and five team but i think the steelers have more impressive wins they you know beating buffalo week one uh being in that game against the chargers so i guess the technically i guess though you would say the broncos kicked the chargers ass so it's kind of yeah, where the no, nuances the only, of the power rankings kind of come into play the only one i disagree with you on that is the eagles and either way i wouldn't i'm not like agreed that the eagles are ahead of the broncos just like, head to head that. which i think you know we talked about the differences between your nba power rankings and the nfl power Power rankings. I feel like head to head definitely carries more weight in the NFL. Yeah, for sure. Because there's only so many games that you're playing during the season and it makes these dramatic swings where, yeah, if the Broncos lose that game, the Eagles are six and six and the Broncos are five and six. So all of a sudden their records are, are different at that point. 
Yeah, and the nature in which the way the Eagles won that game, I mean, it was never even a game. They went into Denver, I believe. They went into Denver and dominated the Broncos. So the Broncos, yeah, are, they the paper bro- li- are they paper tigers? Yeah, I just can't see them as anything more than that. Their record is a facade. It's Fugazi. Fugazi, yeah, no, Fugazi, it is it's because a wazzy, they, it's a woozy. Yeah, because they they pummeled the Dallas Cowboys earlier in the year, and they, they beat the Chargers last week in a game that I'm sure a lot of us picked the Chargers in. So that's kind of an explanation for the Broncos this year. But yeah, they're, they're going to be lucky to get eight wins on the season, and that's totally fine for the Broncos. Like they, see, for them, they probably yeah. want that Browns game back they probably want probably like that game back because if they beat the backup quarterback there if Von Miller gets his way and actually does you know abuse their left tackle then well now they're a seven win team and then it just starts to get hard to get them out of the playoffs because of math I'm glad you mentioned that even they don't believe they're a good team they traded Von Miller like three weeks ago they don't even believe that they're a good team well maybe that's the key hey two and one without Von Miller am I right Technically, yes, but, but oh, oh, and three Rams with Bob Miller. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the Broncos beating the Chargers last week said that was my realization. And I'm like, oh, the Chargers aren't that good. The Chargers are screwed. That was last week's game because not only did the Broncos beat them, they beat them switching quarterbacks. And they beat them wire to wire. And I'm like, oh, the Chargers do have a lot of problems with that roster, don't they? Because that doesn't happen when you're playing a team like the Broncos that we know is not that talented. Well, we're now into December. We're in the final stretch of games here. So things are starting to get a little close, starting to get a little exciting. We're getting into that bowl season here soon. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for the New Mexico bowl that I won't watch. Oh, of course, yes. Oh God, that's good. It's just going to be me do- making sarcastic jokes the whole time. Like there's going to be like four independence bowls and three Gasparilla bowls because there's so many just terrible six and six teams. Did you see the thing with how the ACC standings finished? 58% of the conference finished with either five, six or seven wins. It's unbelievable. Eight teams out of 14 finished with either five, six or seven wins in that conference. Yeah. And yet, you know, hey, everyone wanted to say Clemson's out. Clemson over there finishing nine and three in their season without Trevor. You know, see, the ACC is a nice little cheat code for them because I don't know. Do you think DJ will rebound? Do you think he'll be a better quarterback for them next year? Because he didn't look like an outstanding talent this year. I I know we all had him as a Heisman candidate to start the season. He's fine. He reminds me of Kelly Bryant. He's fine. Well, that, that's a whole, that's not what a Clemson fan wants to hear. Kelly Bryant. What? Yeah, no, he's fine. Guess, he, hey. he reminds me of, um, what, what was the guy who used to play at Stanford? Not Davis Mills, the guy before him, uh, KJ Costello. I was just like, yeah, that's a fine quarterback. You can win with that. That's fine. I guess whenever you, it's just, you know, scales to these things, when you ever Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson, anything's going to seem a little bit suspect after that one. Can't just, again, Clemson caught lightning in a bottle. Clemson, that six-year run of success never happens in college football. For a program with the same athletic budget as Virginia Tech, like that run of success never, ever happens. It was just a lightning in a bottle run for Clemson. They're still going to be really good because now they've invested all the resources in the program. They're just not going to be what they once were. But then again, I did say that about the Golden State Warriors two years ago, and I've been proven quite wrong. But yeah, Clemson caught lightning in a bottle. They're going to play in some Orange Bowls. They're going to play in some Fiesta Bowls. They're going to be a very good program, just probably more like a tier two program now. Because I feel like this five is a bold proclamation games. before a national championship run. Yeah, pretty much. That's how this works, right? Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll go win the championship next year. <laughs> hey, you know, got to make those bold takes. Got to risk it to get the biscuit. You got to throw those cojones on the table. and. You know, sometimes what, what, why are we throwing balls on the table now? What, why are we plopping our balls on the table? (laughs) Because we're just animals establishing dominance at that point. (laughs) Establishing dominance by doubting the Cincinnati Bengals and doubting the Miami Dolphins. (laughs) Josh Allen. (laughs) Throw Josh Allen. Yes. And also doubting Dabo Swinney. Also, yes. We're plopping our balls on the table and saying, Dabo Swinney, you don't have the resources to compete with Alabama. (laughs) You know, I just like to think Dabo is just tuning into this one and just like, you know what? I'm just going to go throw my balls on the table at these recruiting meetings. I don't know. Uh, it's probably wow, a bold okay. strategy. It's probably not a thing that will get recruits. Yeah, no. Uh, speaking of which, is, is this, are his coordinators going to leave now? I know Brett Venables turned down like 
10 jobs over the last five years. Is he going to take one of these jobs finally that are open? His name has been brought up a lot with the Oklahoma job. And I believe he had a coordinator's position there at one point as well. So he's familiar with the organization and the program. So maybe do you think that you can have a quick rebound in secession? Like you said, you think that they're probably dropping down in tier, but do those guys in that locker room believe that they could be a national title contender? I mean, I don't know if Vegas is going to give them a love. I mean, well, here's again, now changing landscape of college football. Are they instantly behind a USC now? Are they, uh, what's, instantly what is the recruiting behind? say for 2021? Yeah. Are they instantly I don't behind know where, LSU? I don't know where they rank in the recruiting base. Because both LSU and USC could instantly just jump programs. I think it all depends on recruiting. I don't know how many five stars Clemson's got over the past couple of years. You know, we've seen it, obviously, with Boise State, just building up enough brand recognition. You get some guys that you don't typically get. So the fact that they haven't had any, they won't have any changes at their main head coaching position bodes well for Clemson in terms of continued success. They're not in danger of like Boise where Chris Peterson could leave at any time. I mean, unless Saban retires. Unless Unless Saban Saban retires. retires, But that's, that's the only real upgrade I could see for like Dabo at this point. Like, it made sense for Brian Kelly to leave to LSU. That's an upgrade. It made sense. I guess, did it make sense for Lincoln to leave? I, I, just from the point of Oklahoma being an SEC team, I think it's an upgrade. Being able to be the king of the Pac-12 for the foreseeable future, I think is an upgrade. It all depends on who Oklahoma hires. I think that's the biggest thing is can you recruit at the level with the other SEC schools? Because just by like money going into the school, I think Oklahoma, I looked this up, they would be the – fourth largest athletic budget in the sec only behind alabama georgia and lsu oh i guess texas is also going in there so texas would be five oklahoma would always have the proximity advantage of being next to texas because i'm trying to think like what is their expectation are they on the same level as an old miss do they feel like an auburn oh they've got to be above old miss well you know, Ole Miss at 10 and 2. Maybe I'm thinking of Lane Kiffin, Ole Miss right now. You know, uh, they're 10 and 2. They're a really good school. They're a really good team in the nation That's fair. at that point. Oklahoma, like if they finish 10 and 2 in the SEC, they're probably about as good as an Ole Miss at that point. Do I see them going undefeated yeah. in the SEC at any point? Do I see them being able to jump Saban in Alabama? Do I see them being able to jump Kirby Smart in Georgia? Because whoever they hire as their next coach then is up against the best coaches in the league. You know, one of the things, too, talked about with Kelly and Riley is these other conferences are starting to get the memo that we have to start doling out money to get these big-time coaches. And we'll see how coaching salaries increase with this, potentially. You know, you start hearing about Mm -hmm. guys getting 10 figures or not 10 figures. You start hearing about guys getting nine eight figures. figures or yeah, nine figures. Nine is a hundred million. Nine is a hundred million. It would be nine figures. But yeah, I, I said this on Take It Easy again. Check it out. Uh, that This feels like more of an anomaly than anything else. Not the trend of like coaches getting giant contracts. That's been the case forever. But the USC and LSU making these like transcendent changing moves feels like it's one off because you're just not going to have enough talented coaches. Now, you might see more like power five to power five swaps than there used to be. But even still, I feel like, you know, Lane Kiffin moving from Ole Miss to Miami, it's not like Fran, it's not shattering college football by having a move like that or having Matt Campbell go from Iowa State to Oklahoma. It's like, that's not like landscape shattering in college Only football. Only shatters it if you believe that he can instantly make Miami a national title contender, which... If you're on that boat, great, but I, I don't think I don't see it just based off recent Miami performances, based off Lane's history of ha- being in charge of a big time program like USC. Yeah. Although I, he's done I, a great job with FAU and Ole Miss, does that translate to finally having the resources he would have at Miami? I just think there's only so many top 10 coaches in college football. And if all of them become secure in their jobs, it's going to be similar to what I think happened in the NBA with player movement, where everyone was like, players keep changing teams all the time. And the NBA has so much player mobility. And like that graphic of in three years, the entire Western Conference All-Star team switched teams and that from a couple of years ago. In the last two years, nobody's really moved around in the NBA because 
Los Angeles is set with their stars. Both Los Angeleses actually are set with their stars. New York is set. Brooklyn, obviously not the Knicks, but Brooklyn is set with a star. Philadelphia is set with their stars. Miami is set with their stars. Like there's just not as many cool options to go to. And so you see a couple players every now and then, but I feel like you're not going to have totally transcendent landscape changing moves because at a certain point, all of the top 10 coaches are going to be happy in their situations. Unless Lincoln's going to up and move again at a certain point, all of them are going to get happy. I think the CFP expansion is going to have a big role in coach mobility too, because if you can keep the same results of your a college football playoff team year in and year out, that should help you keep your job satisfaction to make you feel comfortable in your decision. I feel as though Brian Kelly feels as though he needs to take this job to get more respect, you know, in terms of the players he gets in the recruit level between LSU and Notre Dame. I feel Lincoln Riley's doing this move to get more respect in the power dynamics of the Pac-12, where he can instantly be the lead dog in that conference. The Big 12, too, will get disrespected in the coming year. And certainly when he, they first entered the SEC, they're going to get disrespect. But as a Pac-12, a one-loss Pac-12 team or an undefeated Pac-12 team, they're going to be in the top four year in and year out. I agree 100% with you. I think these are these those two coaches, Lincoln, Lincoln less so because Lincoln, you can kind of make the argument like this might be a downgrade and he's making the move for money and it's just sh- landscape shattering in college football. Brian Kelly, you can see the definitive upgrade from Notre Dame to LSU, like not right now, but he's going to get paid more to do less work because it's easier to recruit at LSU than it is at Notre Dame. LSU has... And- more proof than even USC. Just you have three trophies in the case over the last two decades with three different coaches. Yeah. And two of them being absolute bums <laughs> who won national championships. Literally, Wes Miles just stealing money from Kansas last year and uh, Ed Ogeron. <laughs> Ed Ogeron just Ed, being Ed Orgeron. Yeah. No, that's exactly all you need to say is just end Ed Orgeron. That's perfect. <laughs> One of the podcasts I was listening to was like, how disruptive was his uh, divorce to his career? And yeah, <laughs> I think did he instigate the divorce? I don't even know who wanted the divorce in that situation. It's, it's, I think he I think it was one of those COVID divorces where they just have to live with each other for months and realize they hated each other because no, I remember wait, 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 no, because it happened like right after the national championship. Like it, it happened like in February, right after the national championship. I swear so I heard about it in like March or something like that. But then again, too, I, like people were saying, was he just like gained a little bit too uh too much groupie love at that point too. No, Ed Orgeron became big, big man on campus. Yeah. And Ed Orgeron liked that. If you know anything about him, you know, he had so, some issues in his past as a grad assistant on those crazy Miami hurricane teams. And uh, so some alcoholism in his past, like Ed Orgeron is uh, Ed Orgeron is a character and that he enjoyed being the, 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 he reached the mountaintop and didn't know what to do once he reached the mountain of his profession. This is kind of a weird thing to think about, but w- with like him becoming like the big man on campus and everything, I'm like thinking to myself, could you see a scenario where Ed Ogeron just like had like a random sex tape or something like come out like something like in terms of scandal? oh there there is one thing there there was a Snapchat photo of him in a bed with a girl not that you could see his naked body but you knew he didn't have a shirt on he there there is a photo fo- that photo exists somewhere on the internet of Ed Ogeron in bed with a woman I would love to see like a skit play out of Ed Ogeron like in bed talking dirty just like. Rah, rah, rah. I don't know oh, why I God. like, I kind of need that in my life because it would amuse me, but yeah, well, there's, I have a sixth there's, sense the, of humor. there's the more creepy one. Of course, we've had Orgeron at a, at a gas station with the pregnant wife of a uh, school attendant. <laughs> was like, in fairness, we should work out I, together. We should, I think we should the work athletic out together. pulled that one. They pulled that report because she was not pregnant for the record. Ah, okay. So the, the Made wife of an less athletic director. Disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> we should work out together. But it makes it funny just to set up the joke. Well, you look like you like to work out. We should work out together. If she was pregnant, that would be even worse of a statement. <laughs> like you love to work out. Like how does how does that compute? Yeah, either? no, not great, not great. But anyways, yeah, yeah, LSU. Brian Kelly's gonna get paid more to work less, and that's a clear victory for him. Those two, I feel like they captured moments in time, and it worked out very well for both of them. Yeah. All oh, right, are we guys. still recording? Oh, geez. I yeah, we're, we're still, still recording. recording. All right, Slump Busters. Well, check us out at Slump Buster Podcast on IG, at Slump Buster Pod on Twitter. Check out all of our social medias. Give us a like on YouTube. Give us a five-star on iTunes. Stay safe, happy, and healthy. From Juju Tech Sports and Cattle Better, we will see you next time.